prehistory is a period that had been largely ignored uh, in Greek archaeology, overshadowed by classical sites located mainly in southern Greece. The first steps towards changing this were taken in the early 20th century with the work of Tsudas, Weiss, and Thompson, but were interrupted almost entirely for 50 years due to the turbulent history of modern Greece. The seminal work of Hurtley in 1939 was the first to turn the spotlight to the prehistory of the region of Macedonia in Greece. Interest was renewed in the 1960s when Theochiris and Milucic started working in Thessaly, excavating two important sites, Sesklo and Argisa. These sites were both tells with long-lived successive habitational phases which represent permanent settlements. At the beginning of the Neolithic studies in Greece, Sesklo and Argisa came to be emblematic settlements of the Greek Neolithic period as a whole. The type of the flat extended settlement, represented by thinner deposits and a widespread distribution of dwellings, had been largely neglected mainly because this type of site is harder to find since they remain hidden in the landscape. The habitation patterns in the Greek Neolithic were until recently sketched around tell sites and they set the standards of what a Neolithic site in northern Greece should look like. Coming to the present day, Neolithic research in northern Greece is experiencing an unforeseen bloom with the excavation of many new Neolithic sites during the last decade, mostly due to large-scale construction work. Today, I will be talking about one of these sites that is changing our perceptions of the Neolithic. The site of Revenia is situated in northern Pieria in a well-watered valley flanked to the west by the Pieria Mountains. The excavation was con conducted from 2001 to 2004 by Fotinia Dactilo and Mathos Bessios, archaeologists of the Greek Ministry of Culture. The site was discovered during works for the construction of a poultry fa factory. Revenia belongs to the type of the flat extended settlement. According to its ceramics types, it, it is dated to the early phases of the early Neolithic to the beginning of the middle Neolithic. The most striking feature of the site is its large number of pits which in some areas are very dense or even overlapping. There are in total 86 pits dug into the natural bedrock. They're mostly roughly circular, but there are also some rectangular ones. At times, pits are found associated with post holes. Some of the largest examples with internal features seem to suggest that they were part of semi-subterranean pit dwellings. Other ones, however, seem to have been used to deposit discarded materials. In a few cases, some pits seem to have been the designated discard location for specific materials, and therefore we have shell pits, bone pits, pottery pits, etc. Another important element of the site is its rich burial record according to the standards of Greek Neolithic sites. Eleven burials have been excavated from within pits, demonstrating striking resemblance to burial practices of Anatolia and the Near East. It should be noted that the number of burials is unusually high for a Greek Neolithic site. I started studying the chipped stone assemblage from Revenia in September 2014, and my work is still in progress. The assemblage has almost 2,600 chipped stone artifacts in total. Today I'm presenting the preliminary results from a part of the assemblage. For the first th stage of my, of my study, I chose to target three particularly interesting contexts pits 5, 11, and 24, to which I will return shortly. The raw materials of Ravenia are somewhat remarkable for the standards of northern Greek Neolithic sites. From the materials studied, it seems that obsidian and flint are the two most common raw materials used in the production of stone tools. Obsidian, usually accounting for 1 to 5 percent of northern, of northern Neolithic assemblages, is an exceptionally rare raw material while flint and quartz are usually the ones used more. At Revenia, however, there is clear evidence of in situ napping from the earlier stages of the Chen Operatoire, and furthermore, large quantities of the raw material enter the settlement. Macroscopically, the obsidian is black, milky gray, resembling million obsidian, but such a claim needs to be verified by geochemical analysis. The other common raw material is flint. Even though its presence is to be accept, expected in a northern Neolithic site, the types of flint present at Revenia include two of top quality, chocolate flint and what seems to be honey flint. I hope to verify that today. <laughs> chocolate flint outcrops have been located at the Pindus Mountains in western Greece, 
whereas honey or Balkan flint comes from sources in northern Bulgaria. Both types are especially high quality flints that allow for excellent control over the napping procedure, similarly to obsidian. Apart from these two types of flint, there is also a yellowish white fine grain type that is widely used. I would like to come back now to the context where the material I've studied so far comes from, namely pits 5, 11, and 24. Starting with pit 5, it's the largest and deepest pit found at the site. It's circular and it has large concentrations of pottery and she cells. It, um, it has been divided in three internal shallower pits and it was most likely a semi-subterranean pit house. Chocolate flint is the most common raw material in pit 5 with evidence of in situ napping. The tools, mostly are made, the tools that are mostly made are prismatic blades, which are then used as sickle elements. The obsidian chain operatoire is very similar to the flint one. In situ napping of the material for the production of blades, some of which are later further modified into formal tools, such as denticulates and burins. It seems, though, that, the number of, that a number of blades remain unretouched. This could be because the edge of an obsidian blade is an ideal cutting tool by itself. Most obsidian tools are found fragmented, but that can be attributed to the brittleness of the raw material. Pit number 11 is the largest rectangular pit on site and most likely a house structure. From it, five articulated burials were recovered, which are now under study. The pit was rich in finds, but none of them seem to have served as grave goods. As far as its chip, to chip stone is concerned, the amount recovered is markedly smaller than the previous pit. However, the overall picture is quite similar. There is in-situ napping, but not from the earlier stages, as there are no core pieces. Other than that, the same tool types are present here, burins, blades, sickle elements, among others. The last pit is pit number 24. It is another large circular pit with two internal pits or spaces. Many finds come from this pit, but it's mostly animal bones and some human ones as well that have been recovered from it. Its use is at this point hard to determine. Pit 24 has the most chipstone tools of all three pits examined here, both in flint and obsidian. The obsidian industry has a high number of microliths and prismatic blades, which are later modified into burins or boring tools. Some napping seems to be taking place inside the pit. As for the flint industry, it is mostly prismatic blades and microlithic tools that are being <coughs> produced, as with obsidian. Perhaps the most interesting element of the Revenia chipstone assemblage is the presence of microlithic technology. Microliths are very small fragments of regular prismatic blades, and they're usually one centimeter long. Ethnoarchaeological and experimental research has demonstrated that these tiny tools were usually mounted on handles made of wood or bone, making a so-called composite tool. These tools are most commonly composite sickles and arrows or harpoons. In the case of Revenia, the microliths seem to be the go-to multi-use tool. They're used as scrapers, arrowheads, and sickles. I'm inclined to think that the inhabitants of Revenia preferred microliths because they're easy to make, the difficult part is making the blade, not the microlith, and they act as spare parts in composite tools, that is, they can be replaced easily without having to replace the entire tool or weapon. Microlithic technology is not the norm in Greek Neolithic assemblages. In fact, it is quite rare, another aspect that makes Revenia a special case. We should clarify here that the Neolithic microliths are radically different from their Mesolithic counterparts, and one cannot argue convincingly that they are a remnant of the past. The main difference is that the Neolithic ones are made on blades and are therefore derived from blade technology, whereas the Mesolithic microliths are made on flakes. Even though microliths are not common in Greek Neolithic assemblages, they have been found in Neolithic sites of the Balkans and Anatolia, roughly contemporaneous to Ravenia. One such example comes from the site Aktopraklik in northwestern Anatolia, where a microlithic transverse arrowhead was found lodged in the vertebra of one of the burials. Going back to our case study, at Revenia, the context where most of these microliths come from is pit 24, which, to remind you, was primarily a bone pit. Without the zoarchaeological report on the bones found in the pit, it's hard to say 
but it does seem awfully possible that the abundance of microliths and animal bones might be indicative of post-hunting activities. In this scenario, the microliths, part of composite arrows, were brought back in the site inside the carcasses of the animals that were hunted and put in pit 24, perhaps to be dismembered and prepared for a feast. This hypothesis, however, remains to be corroborated by the zooarchaeological analysis. Therefore, it seems that the inhabitants of Ravenia had invested heavily in their participation in exchange networks, which allowed them access to some of the best raw materials for, for napping. They had connections that supplied them with obsidian, most probably from Milos in southern Greece, chocolate flint from western Greece, and a possible variation of honey flint from northern Bulgaria. This preference from the, for the most luxurious and exotic materials could also be attributed to the high level of technical knowledge the people of Ravenia had. They were very skilled in two of the most difficult napping techniques, pressure flaking and indirect percussion. These techniques can produce very regular and very thin blades that can be used in a variety of tasks. In order, however, to reap the benefits of these techniques, the napper must have good quality raw materials that will allow him or her to have greater control when napping. These are most likely obsidian, chocolate, and honey flint. With regard to the Ravenia toolkit, I believe that it, that it is representative of a permanent settlement in the sense that the tools they made cover their every important task in the everyday life of a Neolithic person. There are sickle elements used in agricultural chores, engraving tools used in woodwork and bone tool manufacture, boring tools to make holes in a variety of materials, and the ubiquitous sharp-edged blade, which makes an excellent all-purpose cut cutting tool. The presence of arrowheads in an agro-pastoral community should not strike us as an oddity. It is well attested that Neolithic people continued hunting wild animals, even though they had theoretically available meat from the domesticated animals. It would be interesting to investigate the role of hunting further to see how frequently they hunted and which species they preferred in order to understand why hunting continued to exist after the advent of agriculture and pastoralism, which provided some food security. In conclusion, I would like to stress how our perceptions of the Neolithic period have changed from the time of the first excavations. Ravenia is a site radically different from what has long been considered a typical Neolithic site for Greece. And yet we see how interesting and successful these people were in their own right. This is yet another example where compartmentalizing and pigeonholing the human experience is doing us a disservice. The more sites we excavate, the more analysis we perform, the more we will come to understand all different versions of living during the Neolithic period. Thank you very much.